Hello and welcome to First Luke, a Bible study looking ahead to the reading for the coming Sunday. My name's Carl and it's good to have you with us. Before we dive into our first Bible study of 2021, if you've not done so already, you might like to download the sheet that accompanies it. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll find the link just below the video. The sheet contains the passage that we're looking at. It contains some uh, other passages that you might want to take a look at and the Bible study questions that we're looking at later on together. And it also has plenty of space for you to make your own notes. So without further ado, let's dive into today's reading, which is from Mark chapter 1, verses 4 to 11. It's a reading that might feel familiar, and that's because it was one of the readings, or part of it was anyway, one of the readings for the second Sunday of Advent. So it's been in our minds fairly recently. And it's a reading in which we find John the Baptist out in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and pointing towards the one who would be coming after him, who would be much greater than him. So that's what we find in verses four to eight. That was our overlap with the second Sunday of Advent. But now we're reading on a few verses into verses nine to 11. And in that, we find that the action shifts from John towards his younger cousin, Jesus. And we find out about what happens after Jesus has been baptised, in which he is affirmed both as the Messiah of Israel and God's son. So our key figures here are obviously John the Baptist, who was the older cousin of Jesus, his forerunner, and someone who had already gathered a movement of disciples to himself, and obviously Jesus, who at this point was based in Nazareth of Galilee. We're reading the earliest account that we have of Jesus' baptism, as Mark's was the first gospel to be written, between about 65 to 70. Um, and that was a period of great turbulence for the people of Israel, um, because the temple would be destroyed in the year 70 by the Romans following the Judean revolt. So the gospel itself comes amidst that turbulence um, and the affirmation that will come to that is given to Jesus, um, I think would have been very powerful for the people in that turbulent situation hearing those words. It's a passage which is loaded with allusions to the Old Testament. And as we move through um, our discussion of it, I'll try and point those out to you. So. We start out with John the Baptist in the wilderness. That's obviously a significant place because we know that God's people, after they had crossed the River Jordan to enter the Promised Land, the same river that John was baptising in, and we know that those people spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness and being crafted and shaped into the people of God. So what John's doing, we've very much got this Exodus symbolism in the background. And it's like the people are being invited to cross over once again from sin into new life in readiness for what's coming after John, the one for whom he is preparing the way to jump back a couple of verses. We know that in Judaism, there were ritual cleansing baths called mikavot. I think I pronounced that correctly, um, but there was nothing quite like John's baptism. It was something new. And it was very much about placing things in a new sphere. It was inviting people to say, I'm ready for God to come. And we know that the word metanoia, that's often translated repentance, means a change of heart, a change of direction. So it was very much about setting Israel on the right footing, turning them around, waking them up, throwing a cold glass of water in their face, and various other images I'm sure you could think of for getting them ready for the one who was to come. Who was so great that John, who was deliberately reminiscent of Elijah, the greatest of the prophets, in what he ate and how he dressed, um, that John wouldn't be fit to untie the thong of his sandals, in other words, to perform the loneliest service for Jesus, 
despite the fact that John himself summed up all of Israel's salvation history up to that point and was indeed greater than Elijah. Evoking the Holy Spirit in verse 8 takes us back into the Old Testament in a slightly different way to Jeremiah this time, to Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 33 and the promise of a new covenant that we find there. And it's very much about the establishment of peace, the establishment of shalom in the land. So we're going to see there's a profound movement from water to spirit that John is pointing to as Jesus is baptised. Verse 9 is where the attention shifts from one cousin to another. And it's significant that Jesus makes quite a long journey, actually, from Nazareth in Galilee to the Judean countryside, to um, the area around the Jordan in order to be baptised. It implies a real intentionality. Jesus sorts this out and it makes it clear that whatever the reasoning behind his decision to do that, although he didn't need a baptism of repentance for himself, it's clear that he supported what his older cousin was doing and supported the need of Israel to repent, to turn around, to wake up and to refocus on God. Now, one of the things that I've had a great opportunity to look at in my, my time was a beautiful icon of the water being sanctified by Jesus as he got into it in an Eastern Orthodox church. And it kind of reminds us that there's a real mystery about why Jesus chose to be baptised. And it was a passage that the early church really had to grapple with because it raises questions. You know, if you're saying this guy's sinless, why did he undertake a baptism? But it's very telling that in verse 10, it's as Jesus begins to emerge from the water that the action really happens. John the Baptist, earlier in our passage, had talked about him baptising with water and Jesus being all about the spirit. And it's like that transition moment has happened. So you could think of it as an invisible curtain that separates heaven and earth being drawn at that point. And once it's been drawn, it can't be shut again. It's notable also that the only other kind of splitting of a curtain, if you will, if I can put it like that, happens when the veil of the temple is torn in two after Jesus' crucifixion. So it gives you an idea of the significance of this moment. So it was a private interaction between Jesus and God. We don't get a sense that anybody else necessarily heard what was said to Jesus. But as I say, it's like this invisible curtain has been pulled apart. And it might remind us, therefore, of another passage we heard during our Advent journey, Isaiah 64, verses 1 to 3, in which the people of Israel, who were in a desperate situation, wanted God to rend the heavens asunder. There's a lot of debate about what the dove symbolises. Some suggest that it could be re-evoking the story of creation in which the spirit hovered over the waters. So I'm going back to Genesis 1 therefore. Others suggest that there's a connection with Noah and the sending out of a dove to look for dry land after the flood, which itself was an event where the um, repentance and new beginnings um, came about. Others point out that in the Hellenistic world, a dove was a symbol of divinity. So it could be as simple as this would have been culturally relevant for Mark's community. They would have understood the symbol of the dove in that way. It may be, of course, that there isn't any great symbolism to it. And it's just what the Holy Spirit happened to look like in that, on that occasion. Um, but it, it gives us a, a kind of sense of, um, particularly if we, if we take the, the connections to, to, to Genesis seriously, a kind of new creation moment was going on as Jesus emerges from the water. After the dove has descended, we learn that Jesus is affirmed as God's beloved son, verse 11, which is a very clear echo, it seems, of Psalm 2, verse 7. And talking about Jesus being um, well-pleasing to God is an echo of Isaiah once again, of Isaiah 42, verse 1. 
And that makes a very profound connection, therefore, between Jesus and the figure of the suffering servant. So there's a holding of those two together. So Jesus, it's, it's kind of being anointed in the way that arguably the servant or the disciple of the servant was in Isaiah 61 verses 1 to 2. Um, and he's being commissioned as Israel's Messiah. That again takes us back to Exodus. So there's an awful lot of Old Testament imagery going on here. And it's clear that Jesus, um, as well as being God's beloved son and Israel's Messiah, kind of represents and embodies what Israel is about. And that may be the explanation for Jesus taking the baptism of repentance, that he was doing it on behalf of all of Israel. And that language of being well pleased with the son is often used in the Bible in relation to an only son. So, for example, Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22. And so that points us to the uniqueness of Jesus. So there's a lot to take in in this amazing and exciting passage. But for me, the most important and most remarkable thing about it is that we are able to stand where Jesus stands because we're able to call God Father because of his life, death and resurrection. It means that we can hear those amazing words, you are my beloved child with whom I am well pleased, addressed not just to Jesus, but to us as well. So as we get ready to delve into our questions, that's a pretty amazing thought for us to have in our minds and hopefully in our hearts too. Thank you.